Uh, it's Gadget UK here again, this time with some uh, C64 keyboard stuff, it should be a short video. Um, I got this from Sparks UK, uh, this is the Saturday SD SDCAR cable it isn't. Um, yeah, so we've got all of the um, keys here I think, there may be something missing, I'm not sure. And we've got the springs in there, so those are going to be cleaned up, some of them are a bit rusty. This is a wee bit rusty as well, so uh, I think we'll start. Oh, <laughs> rusty here as well. So we'll start by removing the PCB, I think, and uh, see if there's any corrosion and damage that needs fixing inside there. Yeah, hopefully I can get this one working. It's a donation to the channel, this, by the way, by Sparks UK. So very, very, very much appreciated. So this is a different keyboard. That other one obviously came disassembled. So, yeah, you can get a keycap uh, puller from eBay for, I don't know, two quid. You just uh, do that. Yeah, so the key... Uh, so the technique is just to you know put it on like that and then rotate a bit so you get diagonal and then just pull upwards. Anyway, I'm not going to pull that one up. And you can see you know each one is a spring underneath. But yeah, it did come uh, in parts because Sparks was about to restore it. So let's just rip this off. I got the spec bars there as well. Look, I'll see if this flat blade is going to do the job. Yeah, I can get those out. It's just these corroded ones. I'm not sure about. Um, let me see if I've got some replacements for these actually. Yeah, there we go. It's coming out. Hopefully the PCB is going to be okay. So it doesn't bode well, does it? If you look at these uh, screws here, uh, half of them are rusted. You know, the half top half of them. Which suggests the corrosion has uh, got right in here, so it might be game over. But uh, anyway, we'll see what we can do. Uh, we need to get this tape off here, don't we? Can't get under the blooming thing. There we go. Let's just peel it off. I can put a piece of captain tape on there afterwards. This is the caps lock, uh, I think. And uh, yeah, you always need to desolder this, otherwise you can't separate the housing from the uh, PCB. So let's just uh, heat. Hopefully it's not wrapped around there. Let's just hold on there. Look, separate that. God, that stinks. Let's try to lift it up a bit off the. PCB there, and they can clean the solder, there we go. Right, I think that's all the screws out. Is it? Is, is there a covert one? There's a covert one here, look. There we go. Right, that should be them all. There we go, it's coming off now. And we'll tilt it this way. And the PCB's alright. There's no issues there, it just needs a good clean. You can see it's had some spills and things in the past here. So we'll uh, yeah we'll clean that up next I think. So you may want to go straight to IPA, but I'm just going to use some soapy water here to get the uh, contaminant off first. And it, you'll see, look, none of the black stuff comes off on these carbonized pads here. I just want to get the dirt, you know, the spill. You can see that's come up really clean there. Yeah, get the spill off first, and then go over it with some IPA. Um, not like this, I don't think. So we've got some corrosion here, look, we could have some damaged traces. I guess I uh, should test that connectivity before I reassemble this. It's coffee or something, I think, it's, it's brown. So the next thing we're going to use here is IPA, because can you see? The soapy water has not cleaned off all that muck there, so let's just touch this with the uh, IPA. It may still not make a, a difference here, because it could be scratches may not be dirt, yeah you can see look it's making no difference at all so it's kind of like uh, impact marks I think um, and we'll obviously we'll focus on this area of the PCB that's got what looks like you know the corrosion here I'm going to test connectivity here in a second, let's just wipe here further afield there, yeah, some dirt's coming off some of that is dirt, some of it isn't when you're using a cotton bud, uh, when you come to clean these pads here just literally wipe them gently don't rub the rub rub, you know, I've seen a few channels, I saw a video last night actually, I think it was on a Game Boy or something, and uh, the person doing the repairs, doing a great job, um, a really good channel, big channel, bigger than mine, but uh, he was uh, rubbing quite a bit, the uh, carbonised pads there, and you wear the surface off, you can only do that so many times, you want to just literally, I'll show you, wipe like that, that's it, and then dry, you barely want to take anything off them. You see how dirty this is though, this is really bad. Yeah, I'm not going to go to town there because you can see there's a bit of wear there already on those. And to expedite, I'm going to use uh, this like this actually. You can see very little's coming off that, but just a little wipe like that. 
just keep checking that just to make sure you're not rubbing too much off of a given area The other thing I thought is I could just go connect this up actually and we can test it out and bring the plungers over, one of the plungers. You can see there's a bit of a copper there, can you see that? That's obviously got worn in the past. Um, so yeah, the next thing I'll just get a cotton bud around this connectivity here because there's a bit of flux or something. And then I'm going to take uh, one of these and maybe go and test it I think. Right, yeah, believe it or not, that is much cleaner. <laughs> it doesn't look it, but it is. There's uh, still has some marks and things here that I guess I could just wipe over. So I think it works, just pressing here, you can see we get characters appearing. So, yeah, as I just go around and test some of the random rows and columns and things here in different areas, everything seems to be working. So I can't test the function keys. Um, I can press them though, and you'll see the character flashing changes. If I put one on F4, hang on a sec. You can see it there, as I press it, it stops, it changes the, the speed it's flashing. Same with F3, let's do F2, F2, yeah, I can press it multiple times there. And I'm just bobbing up and down with it there when I do that, hang on. Yeah, tap, 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 tap. You see it changes, it goes pulse, 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 and I just tap, 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 it flashes. So. The keyboard PCB is okay, actually. I just need to now clean up the plastic housing, clean up all these uh, plungers, and uh, start to reassemble it. But, so I think the next thing to do is get all of these out of here, and the easy way to do that is to do that, I think. But this obviously needs a good scrub, it's really dirty. And then obviously we've now got a million and one of these to collect. So as you can see, I've got a yeah, takeaway tub there. <laughs> yeah, every time my wife orders... Uh, mushroom curry or something, I wash these, they need soaking for a fair bit because they smell of mushroom curry for a while, even after they've dried actually uh, but anyway that's the least of this keyboard's worries really if it smells a little bit like mushroom curry is anyone going to be bothered? I don't know, takeaway uh, may go up in that area as a result, whoever buys it so yeah we can clean these up as we get them in I think, the, they're alright okay those don't need anything doing other than uh, you know a quick wipe there when we reassemble push this downwards like that that's it and I think it should push push through maybe there's one there as well mm, maybe not maybe it's no it is it's pushed in from the underside there so ah oh, this clips is the clips on the sides as well no there isn't there's just a clip on the top there and a clip there well, that ain't coming out, is it? Yeah, there's two components to this. There's like a black piece of plastic here that clips on the top. Yeah, and that probably holds it in so it stays in. But then you've got those two clips. So, yeah, you can't just get it out by pushing those clips like that. You need to unclip this top piece here somehow, I think. I don't want to damage it, so I'm just going to scrub all around there, leave this bit, and then cl clean this bit here with IPA and cotton buds afterwards. Does that make sense? So we'll just focus on uh, you know the majority of it in the sink with hot soapy water there. So that has had a wash in the sink. I've scrubbed it. Uh, and now just going to use a bit of uh, vinegar and a cotton bud here to go around these bits here because I've tried to wipe <coughs> and it's not coming off. Now vinegar, with it being uh, an acid, should just help with that corrosion there because it's rust, isn't it, that's kind of etched its way into the surface of the plastic a little bit. Managed to just leave it there for a few minutes. Now the caps lock uh, did get wet actually, I didn't intend it to but it got wet in the sink. So I'm uh, going to flood a load of uh, IPA through that as well. So using IPA this time. And uh, yeah with this I am uh, literally going to try and trickle it down the centre point there. Like that. Just to get some IPA in to dislodge any water that may have got in there. And I'll do that a few times, not now particularly, but you know, once I finish cleaning up and stuff, I will do the same thing. May even spray some contact cleaner in there, just to try and avoid any of that moisture starting any corrosion inside that. So the vinegar does very little. I've used the fiberglass brush, and there's still some rust there. Look, this is the problem. So I've now resorted to using this tool actually to scratch. The majority of it off then use a uh, paper towel with vinegar on it 
white vinegar. But yeah, if you scratch any of this uh, corrosion off, it uh, doesn't dissolve just with the vinegar on its own. It might do if you soaked the whole thing in vinegar for, I don't know, an hour or something. But this rust is proving really hard to get rid of. So yeah, scratching uh, the majority of it off, and it's, some of it's right at the side, some of it's just at the bottom on the edge. Um, and then wipe around with some vinegar. You can see a big chunk of it there. Let me show you that one. So let's just uh, scratch. Scratch into that all around there. And it's all around this side as well. And then at that point, uh, just get your paper towel with some uh, white vinegar on it. And uh, circle it like that. Press your nails into the gap if you can. And uh, yeah, most of it's come away there, I think. But there's still some. You can still see it here. Well, this is what I hate about these. When the springs corrode like this. So yeah, it's going to take me a good hour, I think, to get this plastic piece uh, in a good enough condition before we can start to consider reassembling it. So it's easily taken me an hour to get rid of the rust off that, actually. You know, you can see some of the plastic's a bit scratched up where I've used the wire brush or the fiberglass brush, but all of the orangey stuff has gone. It doesn't look like that in places, but yeah, it has. Yeah, it's much cleaner. So, I'm going to get the uh, keys back into here again. I think, you know, the plunger parts. And we'll start to reassemble it. I think I need one of those cutscenes. This is like two hours later. Because <laughs> this is like a nightmare. It takes so long putting in. I'd obviously got to wipe over each one of these. And I could do them before I fit them in here. But you know what, I want to get them in. And then I'll just go over with the con swab on each one gently. This is uh, also one of those examples where, uh, a bit like the Atari ST, if you get something to hold up here on the sides, yeah, both, you can just sit it flat. But if I put this down there, you can see it starts to push and then obviously some of them de-seat themselves. Right, supported off the floor with two plastic containers here and I'm literally just gonna wipe over each of these with some IPA like this. It would have been easier, definitely, to have done this before fitting them. I'm using the dry end there now. But I'm just going to go down each column uh, like that and uh, give them all a gentle clean. And then make sure there's no hairs or dust. And then we need to align this and it goes this way around. And it's obvious because obviously you've got the caps lock there. So, yeah, that clips on with some little plastic guides, I think. Now I've got some replacement screws here. Uh, one or two of them I'm going to swap out. The ones that are super corroded I will swap out for new ones. Let me just make sure that these are definitely the right physical size. Yeah, so comparing the new screw to that one, they are a bit shorter. These may have come from an ST or something, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to go with those super corroded ones like that. Any that are super corroded ain't going back on. So let's just try this one first of all. Let's sort of stick it on the outside there. Yeah, that's going to be fine. So, yeah, new screw. So I haven't finished getting all the screws in yet. Some of them are in some vinegar at the moment. Um, and just to give it a quick test, and it seems to be okay. So I may as well commit to soldering the caps lock uh, on. So let's just uh, get a little bit of uh, solder on there. And I'm just going to just literally pull this into position, I think. That's one. Get rid of that streak of solder there in a second. They probably were at some point originally hooked over there, but they weren't when uh, it came to me. And just soldered on at the side like that. There we go, that should do. So let's just uh, make sure those are on there. Yeah, they're not moving. So the caps lock is now reintroduced. Right, let's get the space bar uh, bar back on. Space bar bar. That sounds like a game on the C64, doesn't it? Something to do with sheep. Space bar bar. Coming soon to a C64 near you. So let's get that little bit of corrosion off there, and I'll just wipe over that with a bit of uh, WD-40. You could just use three in one oil or something when you're wiping something like that, just to make sure. Well, try and help it stop corroding again. Generally, you know, those things won't stop rust entirely. It will just come back. 
unless you plate it with something ultimately or cover it in grease or oil you know a thick grease or an oil uh, there's a bit of corrosion there look that's better just come off that now yeah there was a bit of corrosion still stuck on there so uh, I think this just went through there like that oh hang on yeah that's it that's on and you know, sometimes actually, these bar things like this, I'm not sure if there's one of the return key, there isn't it? Is there? It's easier to get them onto this first, I think. Um, let's try that again. The bar is on the opposite side of these uh, posts here, yeah? So I think that's right, because yeah, it goes that way, doesn't it? And then it's going to go like that sort of thing, I think. So if we try and clip this bar on first, oh, that may help. If assuming all these white bits are connected the right way around here, because they might not be. Is that in? Yeah, it is. And then slide it over, put the spring under there. Is it in there? And then do that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so space part done. There's a little mark there. Get some plastic cleaner onto that later. And I've wiped this before putting it on, actually. Because I'm not sure if these keys have been cleaned. So these springs, ideally you would want to replace them, but yeah, I just go over them with the wire brush. And you tend to find it's quite superficial, uh, unless obviously it's had a lot more time to corrode, and in which case the springs will probably just break on you when you do this. Yeah, so it's more corroded on one side than the other. So instead of facing it down, I put the uh, more corroded part facing uh, up, actually just to give it an alternation, if you know what I mean. Uh, in fact, that's the next one's over here, U. So we've got to UIOP. There we go. Yeah, so I would consider that good enough to go back on. It is a bit dull but the corrosion has gone uh, and as I say I'm putting the corroded bit upwards because previously these were all like that with the corroded bit downwards so almost two hours later we're just down to the last uh, few springs uh, and some of these are obviously uh, a lot more rusty than others yeah I'm not sure if you can see the redness there but anyway every single one of these springs have been painstakingly cleaned up Then the rag with uh, WD-40 here, and you can see all the rust comes off, look, loads of it. But super, super time consuming. And there we go, a fully assembled keyboard, and it works perfectly. I've tested every single key on this. At the same time in this video, I thought it would be useful to show the digital side. Yeah, just talk about what else can go wrong. So we fixed the keyboard you've just seen, but you just have this cable that comes off here, and all these wires are doing is going to that PCB, which is, you know, half these are going to be rows, half of them are going to be columns. Not necessarily in the order I've just indicated there. And on the bread bin board, the connector is here, yeah, right next to uh, U1, the CAA. The connections actually go here to port A and port B. You know, this provides I.O. The CIAs here provide I.O. You've got two 8-bit two ports, port A and port B on each of these. And if we have a look at the schematics here for the bread bin, we've got row, you'll have to take my word for it if you can't read that, we've got row 0, row 1, row 2, all the way down to row 7, we've got col 0 all the way down to col 7. So the keys are arranged into rows and columns, yeah? So it's for the CIA to detect a key press, what it's doing, it's got two different ports here, port A, PA0 to PA7 I think, and PB0 to PB7, and those are connected up to the columns and the rows. So it'll be putting a signal out on one of these, maybe a high or a low, and then scanning back on the other one, on this, you know, the, the other bank, yeah? So let's say it puts a high out on uh, PA0, yeah? Uh, and then scans PB, but it's, you know, low on all the others. You're just gonna get nothing here unless a key is pressed. If a key is pressed, the connection between the row and the column are joined up. So therefore, on the other port, and that might not be the way it does it, it might do the opposite way around there, and it might not be high, it may be a low. Um, 
but the point is that's how it does it you know it outputs on one port scans the other port you know a, a, a bit at a time there and works out which keys are actually held down which ones are pressed so if you know the keyboard's okay and you've done everything that I've done in this video here you want to be looking at uh, U1 your CAA and on the C64C or E actually as it's uh, referred to I think the later one the, the, the E I think is the one that has not got the colour ram here so we've got a video coming up where I'm looking at this actually with uh, in relation to the colour ram stuff with a diff the two different versions of this PLA you know one version of this PLA here has not got the colour ram and that's on the E I think and then the earlier revision 64C board which may still be arc C64E I'm not sure but anyway the earlier one has uh, got a separate colour ram here and it's got this that's the only difference between the two PLAs but anyway I'm sidestepping the point I was trying to make is it's uh, this IC here for the keyboard on the this board and again again it's U1 so they did keep the part designation the same there U1 right next to the keyboard connector here so it is on the right rather than all the way on the left that's the difference between the uh, bread bin boards you know the long boards and these uh, short boards here now the other thing that could complicate matters here you can see there's a, a bilateral switch here a 4066 which is used for pot x and pot y yeah but it taps into the row and column stuff here uh, well maybe not the row and column stuff yeah it's just the rows we've got two of the bits for the rows go to that so i can't be 100 percent sure how that works i'm guessing the cia is driving those here yeah so i'm not sure what the two column connections are used for there on that 4066 but if something went wrong with that 4066 in theory i guess it could be influencing those two column lines um I'm not sure that you'd, you'd have to get a specific type of fault for that to occur, but just bear that in mind. If you've ruled out U1, yeah, and it does look like it's you know it's not your keyboard, you've ruled out U1. Just consider that maybe that might be doing something weird with those two column connections there. So I thought it was worth just showing you this uh, matrix here, this grid. You've got the rows and the columns, and you can see where each row and column coincide to get a specific key. So here's an example of that. I've got a row and a column here on the meter. It's on continuity test. So, so when that row and column join together, it will beep. And if I press some of the keys here, as soon as we get to the key where those two coincide, we get a beep. Any other key on this keyboard will not give a beep. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so you can test your keyboard that way. You know, if one key is not working, and you can see which key I'm pressing there. It's that one actually. So you could test your keyboard that way before you disassemble it and of course putting it on resistance mode there and actually measuring the resistance is a good idea so you can see there about 66 ohms roughly and dropping yeah so that's a good example of 70 look on a second press let's press it a few times yeah about 70 ohms uh yeah so if that was too high there let's say you pressed that key and it was like i don't know a k or something it wasn't uh beeping on the connectivity test that might be an indication you just need to clean the contacts up there um there are uh, things you can do to those pads as well i've seen people resurface those with uh, new conductive uh, you know carbon ink or whatever um but it can be sometimes the little rubber you know the the piece that the plunger that goes down with the black uh, rubber that's like conductive also those can deteriorate as well i've seen a few of hey burt's videos where that's happened seems more common on amigas than c64s but it can happen so yeah maybe check out hey burt's channel for examples on how to uh, deal with that problem if you've got a high resistance there when you press that key so I apologise again in advance, the, the print here is really small. If you need to go further back, if you've done all those other things and you still have got a keyboard problem, do consider the, um, obviously the PLA. There are some connections from the PLA that go to the 139 here, the LS139. This does the address decoding and provides the chip selects for the two CAAs, I think. Yeah, they're down here, CIA1, CIA2. So these two are all part of the same chip. That's the LS139. And you can see that there, where we replaced that in the previous video. So yeah, if the chip select for that CIA wasn't getting there, you'd probably uh, know about it. You'd probably have like, uh, you know, no cursor, etc. So again, that would be a clue that it's uh, perhaps, you know, the CIA or this. And the final point I'll make there on the same subject of keyboard problems and the, uh, you know, the CIAs. I have seen it where if you get a slightly low 5 volt rail, you know, the main 5 volt rail. Let's say it's down to 4.7 volts-ish, borderline 4.7 volts. 
I have seen problems on ports on these. Yeah, you've got port A, port B on both of those. I've seen problems where the ports, or is it pull downs? I forget, but there's a resistor on each one of them internally. And uh, the subtle variations, maybe from a previous short or some ESD damage that's occurred, sometimes you can, that can mean that lower, slightly lower voltage means that it doesn't flip between logic high or low as it should do and just by virtue of increasing the voltage from 4.65 to say 4.75 or 4.8 suddenly that CIA port that bit on that port is now not an issue I've seen that a number of times I've even seen the same thing on a couple of Amiga boards that's done the CIA's there where some damage occurs to a, a, a pin on one of the ports there that means it's uh, not quite as good at pulling one way or the other as it should be but as soon as you deal with a voltage issue to the board you clean the power connectors and clean the power switch and all that and you get right back up to 5 volts suddenly you've not got a problem it's gone away I've got a couple of CIA's like that that I keep for testing and they work perfectly and every board I throw them into but if I put one of those CIAs into a board that's got dirty like you know power switch for example and it's, and it's like 4.7 volts that CIA will be a problem I've seen it on joystick ports as well so this C64 will be uh, part of the next video but anyway you can see the keyboard in there now it works perfectly every single key works fine so very very pleased thank you very much to Sparks UK I know I said that was a final point but I've got one or more two points here so the other point here uh, the keyboard here you can see obviously it's a C64C but the keyboard is the same well it's not the same the keys look different but uh, generally they're interchangeable there are a few different models some of the older C64 and VIC-20 keyboards are manufactured slightly differently so I think you may not be able to replace the plungers and things between every single model there are some different variants uh, the Mitsumi one I think this is Mitsumi that you've seen in this video is pretty common though and whilst you can fit the bread bin keyboard here in a C64C case and vice versa, you know, you see them on eBay all the time that way. You know, you see a bread bin with white keys or you'll see beige slash cream 64Cs with uh, the dark keys here. Trying to fit a VIC-20 keyboard in here could be a challenge because I think the plastic surround is slightly different. It's just ever so slightly different. That means fitting in a bread bin is easy, a VIC-20 keyboard, but trying to fit a VIC-20 keyboard in here could be more difficult. But they've got the same number of keys here. I think the pet ski and stuff is the same as well. So yeah, you can actually, uh, you know, they're interchangeable to a degree. And I've got a spare one here, I'll show you, which I use for C64s and VIC-20s. There'll be some VIC-20 videos coming up as well. So the final, final, final point on this is the restore key. So we covered the stuff with the rows and columns, you know, as one row sort of touches a column as you short the key, yeah, it's able to detect that you've got a connection down one row into one column, yeah, but there's an exception and that is the restore key. The restore key is done differently. So you've got your keyboard connector here, you can see restore there has its own dedicated connection, it doesn't go through the rows and columns of the matrix, yeah, it is just a single connection that comes all the way down. I know you're a long way away there, but the restore signal comes down here and it goes into what I think is the trigger on the 556. But it then goes, uh, you know, the signal out is buffered by 7406, I think. That's an open collector uh, inverter, is it? And then the output goes to the NMI connection, non maskable interrupt, I think, which goes up to the CPU which you can see there so that's direct to the CPU so that restore key when you hit the restore key you raise a non maskable interrupt I am aware of an issue that I saw a video recently I think it was on Retro Marky's channel where that restore functionality was not working as well as it should have done and I think you had to do a mod here you know, you did something with resistor it might have been this resistor here that was incorrectly sized on earlier boards or there was something he did here so I'll see if I can find a link to that maybe he can if he sees this he'll post down in the comments below but uh, yeah that's just something to consider as well that if you've got some an issue with the restore obviously check your schematics first compared to your board but uh, maybe check out his channel and have a look for that video because yeah there's something in the back of my mind saying there's a potential mod you can do here to make that restore uh, button work better so even though that raises a non-maskable interrupt i think there are ways around that i was reading on one of the wikis a technique is used to raise an interrupt on the cia and don't let the line go back uh, high again or something just keep it stuck in interrupts which disables that from working i think i'm not sure whether that's used in games and stuff but anyway if we just switch this on and at the same time it's worth mentioning perhaps in the vic 20 it's done differently it doesn't go directly to the cpu in the vic 20 that goes via one of the vias <laughs> via 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 
yeah, the equivalent of the CIA here. So if we just do that, I'd type some basic intent print. Gadget UK164 sucks. There you go. I'm saving you having to do the trolling. I'm doing it for you. And if we do 20 go to 10, uh, we do run. So imagine you've got some machine code in there as well. Yeah, it might not necessarily just be all basic. You could have some, I don't know, some data statements. So I'm assuming you can do the equivalent in basic here, where you're doing something where you can't break out the loop. Normally you press run stop and that works. But let's say you couldn't do, then you press uh, run stop and restore at the same time. So you see it just say ready at the top there. So that raises that non-maskable interrupt. The kernel in basic, the way that handles that, is to just well stop what's running, you know, totally in its tracks, and bring you back to that ready screen. If you type the list, the code's still there, so you've not lost it. So yeah, that's uh, a useful thing if you're programming with BASIC to be aware of, I guess. Yeah, so on this one here, that functionality works. Um, this does have a breadboard in there, in this machine. So uh, I don't know, maybe Retro Marky just had the faults on this, I'm not sure. It's me again, back with another final, 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 final point. If you uh, check the links down below, you may still be able to order some new keys. Uh, and if you can't, still worth checking the links down below, because uh, when the uh, campaign there, I think it's on Indiegogo, isn't it? When that campaign completes, there will be a load of keys available to purchase. I know it was a short one, we're covering all ground again here, but uh, yeah, I just needed to get this one out of the way. Hopefully you found it interesting. Please like, share, subscribe. I'll catch you in the next video.